نعوذ ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات ليستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم ولا يمكنن لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم ولا يبدلن بعد خوفهم امنا يعبدونني لا يشركوا بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فاولئك هم الفاسقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد so today, inshallah, we will be uh, going over some of the ijtihads of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And he is indeed a person that people have no understanding of his greatness. Um, you know, when I say Abu Bakr, a certain image comes to your mind. When I say Umar, a certain image comes to your mind. But when I say, when you say Ali, a certain image comes to your mind. But when you say Uthman, generally people are blank. Like, who was he? And there are many reasons for this. I'm not going to go into the reasons we don't understand Uthman. But it is interesting that the Prophet said, أَكْثَرَهُمُ الْحَيَاءُ Uthman." That the most modest of them was Uthman. Meaning he was shy. He was always shy. He always wanted to be in the background. He didn't ever want to come in the front. So even in the historical image of the Muslims in, our, in the legacy of our minds, Uthman is kind of like hidden. He's... He's shy in that sense. It's, it's a reflection of his shyness, you can say. But you can say also, on the other hand, Uthman is probably the person that has been treated most unjustly, historically speaking, of all the great people. Uh, and I'm going to go into some of that. Of course, I don't have... That's not my topic. My topic is not the history of Uthman, but the ijtihadat of Uthman. So, the first case that came in front of Uthman. In fact, before that, I want to mention that when Umar made the council, in those three days, because Umar said that by the fourth day you have to nominate the next Khalifa. So now you have three days, there's no Khalifa. So who will be the interim president, you can say? Who will be the interim leader in these three days? So the person uh, Umar had chosen to be the Khalifa for three days was Suhaib al-Rumi. Suhaib al-Rumi, he was commanded by Umar to lead all the prayers and be the Khalifa until the next Khalifa is chosen, which was Uthman radiallahu anhu, which I'll go into. I'm not going to go into how he was chosen historically. It's very interesting. It was probably the actual first free election, you can say, where the Muslims actually chose somebody. Because in the case of Abu Bakr, there was a shura and they gave bayat to him. In the case of Umar, Abu Bakr elected Umar to be the next leader. But in the case of Uthman, there was an actual asking the public who should be the next Khalifa. And you can say that, you know, because if you remember what I have been talking about, that in the time of Abu Bakr, people had refused to give zakat, people were claiming to be false prophets. So there was an emergency state, and that emergency state led into Umar, you know, because when you bring a system, when you bring a certain way of life, you have to kind of enforce it, right? So uh, even democracy will come by force when it initially comes. So in the same way, Abu, uh, Abu Bakr nominated Umar that you be the next Khalifa to continue that process of... But now when Islam had been in the hands of Umar for 10 years, Islam had been expanding. And, uh, and a lot of parts of per Persia had been completely conquered. A lot of parts of the, the Byzantine Empire, which were the two empires, they were facing difficulties from the Muslims, the Byzantine was losing ground. And now Uthman comes in, elected by the Muslims, because now Islam has really rooted itself into the, into, the, into the area. So the first case that comes to Uthman's doors is a very interesting one. One of the sons of Umar, one, Ubaidullah, he heard that uh, there, you know, Umar was killed, everybody knows, because Islam is expanding, and there was a, you could say, a, a, a feeling of, uh, a feeling of we need vengeance against what has been done to the Persian Empire. And so, Abu Lulu Feroz, for example, and the others. I'm not going to go into the history again. 
We talked about the cases, the case judgments. So, Ubaidullah heard that it wasn't just one person, but it was a conspiracy. That there were three, four people involved, and he got the names of the people that he thought, basically he heard, a rumor. Nothing was verified. It didn't go through the court system, didn't go through any of the institutions. Uh, Ubaidullah heard that these three, four people, they were involved in the murder of his father, Umar bin Khattab. So, Ubaidullah went and killed four people. He killed, uh, he killed <coughs> four people. I won't go into the details of who they were. But he killed four people in vengeance of his dad. Now, this, of course, Islamically would be incorrect. You have to go through the court system to do this. You have to prove that. So, the first case that comes to Uthman's door, the very first case was, okay, here is Ubaidullah. He's the son of Umar bin Khattab. He just murdered four people. Now there has to be qisas. There has to be life for life or blood money or something. And a lot of the great Sahaba were of the opinion he needs to be executed. Because he did murder. Ali radiallahu anh very sternly said, no, he has to be executed for committing such a crime. I mean, he killed four people. And mind you, some of those four people were Muslims, clearly. Uh, so, Uthman, and he was told by other companions, no, we just buried Umar, and now we can't just go and execute his son, because his son had done these murders. We can't execute his son the very next day and then, uh, ex and then bury him too, so let's think about what we can do. So Uthman came up with what is called in Sharia a ruhsa or a hilya. A, a loophole, so to say. And the loophole, it's not really a loophole, it's very well thought out, which is Uthman said that because these people have no varasa, they have no, in, there's no one to inherit, meaning when there's a murder case, your family decides what is going to be done. Right? In Islam, the government is responsible only for capturing the murderers not executing the murders until the family members decide they want blood money, they want to forgive him, or they want life for life. This is, the Islamic government captures the culprit. And then the family members, they decide. Now, if you have no family members, who decides if you have no family members? Well, the one who decides if there's no family members in any case, if there's no family members, for, let's say a girl to get married, or in any of the cases in Islam, if there's no family members, it's the Khalifa, or the Amir, or the Imam. He takes place of the family members. And Uthman said, since these four people had no family members, therefore I'm their representative. And because I am their representative, I'm going to ask for blood money. And I'm going to set, according to the Sunnah of the Prophet, this much he has to give per person, which was 100,000 dirham. And so Uthman radiallahu anh, took Ubaidullah and said, you have to give 400,000 dirhams as blood money for these people that passed away. And then he took it, the money out of his own pocket and put it in the public treasury, 400,000 dirhams he paid on behalf of Ubaidullah. Now, so this was the first case. And this kind of shows you the attitude of Uthman radiallahu. And maybe if it was some of the other companions, they would have been very harsh <coughs> And, you know, Umar, ashaddu fi amrillahi Umar. And the most harsh in the commandments of Allah is Umar, right? So he's the most harsh when it comes to the commandments of Allah. But Uthman was lenient. And this reflects throughout his, his, uh, his caliphate, which you'll see. Which, even towards the end, because one thing that has to be clear about the caliphate of Islam, I'm not going to talk about Uthman, but about his caliphate, has to be clear is that he ruled for 12 years. And in this 12 years, there was such a massive extension of expansion of Islam, such an extension of growth of Islam. People have to realize that the extension of Islam that, that we had during the time of Uthman, we never had after that. Meaning, we may have had some small uh, victories, but majority of the victory that we have, that we see the Muslim world, was all under the hands of Umar and then Uthman. And then that's, after that, the expansion basically stopped. You have till the Oxus River of Russia, so you have all those Kazakhstan, you know, Uzbekistan, 
all the until the Russia, till China, and there are some even records that show that Uthman had uh, an army that even went into Spain. Even though we usually, when we talk about Spain, we talk about Tariq bin Ziyad being the first person to go to Spain, but there are records that show Uthman was already thinking of Spain. He had written letters about uh, going into Spain, and he had even in a narration he says, which is very interesting from the perspective of future events, because Uthman عنه, in one of the letters had written that Constantinople, which is one of the prophecies of Islam, will be conquered from the side of Spain. So anyway, that's something he had written. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Islam had grown so much. He had, he had the, yani the Baytul Mal had funded 5,000 masajids. Can you imagine in 10 years making 5,000 masajids, 5,000 mosques? In 10 years as Islam is expanding. That was Uthman. Uthman was, you can say, uh, I wouldn't say Bill Gates, because, you know, he's kind of like an innovator also. He innovated something new, right? Microsoft, before Microsoft, there was no proper use of computers. But he was like Jeff Bezos. You know, anybody know who know Jeff Bezos is? He's, he's, uh, he's, the, he's the founder of Amazon, okay? Amazon is the store of everything. Usman radiallahu was so rich, he was like, he was like the trillionaire of his time. He was so, so rich. He was able to, I mean, he had enough money to do anything he wanted in the world, which, by the way, he mentions, he says that, you know, I never wanted the, uh, the, the caliphate. I had everything before the caliphate, meaning I had all the money, I had everything. He had to give up his money for becoming the khalifa because he was one of the, he, was, he obviously didn't have a stipend. For being a Khalifa. He was so rich. Uh, 5,000 mosques were developed during his time. The mosque of the Prophet was made bigger because more people were accepting Islam, more people were coming to Medina. Uh, during his time, a lot of you know wells, which may not be a big deal today, but in Medina more wells were constructed. In Mecca more wells were constructed. Throughout the Muslim world, all sorts of construction was done and infrastructure was made. Uh, another thing that's very interesting about, just to give you an idea, before we even go into his ijtihadat, uh, another very interesting thing that was done was, you know, whenever, like I said, there's a revolution, there's always a counter-revolution. So, the Muslims had conquered the, uh, the Persians, and the Persians tried to make a comeback. The Persians tried to make a comeback, Uthman radiallahu anh crushed all of that. The same way the Byzantines tried to make a comeback, you know, the first naval force was constructed, was built. The first naval army of the Muslims was built by Uthman radiallahu anh. So he did all of this in, in the 10 years that he had. So he had to go through a lot of ijtihad, and again, I won't be going through all of them, but the first case kind of gives you an image. The first case, which I was talking about, Ubaidullah, gives you an image of what he was uh, like in terms of his ijtihad. So one of the other ijtihads he made was, in contrary to Umar, uh, I will share with you something interesting. Umar saw the purpose of the Khalifa, or the main role of the Khalifa, is to enjoin good and forbid evil. As the Prophet said, Ashadu fi amr Allahi Umar, the most severe in the affairs of Allah is Umar. So Umar was all about don't let people do wrong. Don't create a situation where people might end up doing wrong. Uthman radiallahu when his ijtihad was, the role of the Khalifa is not to necessarily stop people from doing wrong. He saw that as the Khalifa, my job is the prosperity of the people. My job is, as a Khalifa, people should be more prosperous five years from now than they are today. And so Umar and Uthman had this, you could say, the core of their thinking about what is the role of the Khalifa differed in this sense, in the sense that Umar saw, my job as a Khalifa is to enforce the will of Allah, my job is to keep people from doing wrong. This is the, per this is the function of the Khalifa. Uthman radiallahu anh, he says that a Khalifa should be judged upon the amount of prosperity he brings to the people. And so just in the light of this, uh, I'll read to you in a letter uh, that he had, uh, actually an, ad an address he had given in the mosque of the Prophet, just a part of it. I'm going to, um, uh, but before I give this address uh, of Uthman, I want to also mention some of the other ijtihads he'd made. So one of the ijtihads he had made, as, as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned last time, Umar radiallahu anh had stopped the movement of the companions of the Prophet from Medina. He wouldn't let them leave. 
Medina. Uthman radiallahu when he said, go. If you want to go, go. And, and he saw this is necessary also because Islam was expanding so much that there had to be companions of the Prophet throughout the Islamic empire now. Otherwise, Islam would be just limited to Medina and, and so the, the influence of the companions of the Prophet had to be all over the Muslim lands. So Uthman radiallahu anh made the ijtihad, contrary to the ijtihad of Umar, that no, don't stay in Medina, go out, teach the people, let them learn from you. And so, but what happened as a result of doing that is that he lost his, a lot of his base. Meaning, you have to kind of keep in mind that there was a group that was really tight, right? It was Abu Bakr and Umar, these people, they went through the battles, they went through Badr, they went through Uhud, they went through Ihzab, they were with the Prophet. They went through everything together around the Prophet, right? And all of a sudden that whole group, right? That whole group that had done everything around the Prophet. And it's, it's how big is this group? The core group is around 3,000 people, right? So now this core group, some of them have passed on, they have passed away. Some of them have now left in the 10 years of Uthman, right? So they, because the Islamic empire, so Uthman says, go, go. But he now loses his base to support him as the Khalifa. Keep this in mind. Second thing is that Umar radiallahu anh had forbidden the people of his family members and the Quraysh from buying and selling property in other places. Like you can't buy land in Iraq, you can't buy land in Iran, you can't buy land in whatever, Khorasan or any other place. Uthman said, no, 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 if you want to buy land, if you want to be prosperous, again, that was the main part of his thinking, if you want to be prosperous, you want to build wealth, go ahead, do it. Umar <laughs> Allah would stop the, you could say the vanguard, the, the, the companions of the Prophet from building Wealth. He had closed doors. He was very harsh on his family, especially his family members. He was very strict on them, and he was very strict on the court.